In this example, we're just trying to show you how the tools recognize that you're triggering off the negative edge of your clock. So here we have a clock with a 10 nanosecond period constraint, and the first flip-flop is toggled off the rising edge, while the second flip-flop is toggled off the negative edge. So as you have probably already figured out, this means that the constrained pa delay path should now be constrained to 10 nanoseconds, but 5 nanoseconds. So what happens is the tools will use the 5 nanoseconds as a constraint, and after implementation is completed, you can generate a timing report. And it will report the delay path as being constrained to 5 nanoseconds, not 10. No big deal, except if you do not realize that you are toggling off the negative edge, this might pleasantly surprise you that the tools were thinking about your design and trying to anticipate a problem. The Constraints Editor allows you to enter in an input clock jitter. This enables the implementation tools to plan the place and route appropriately so the jitter can be tolerated. But don't forget, if you have excessive input clock jitter, the newest FPGAs have dedicated PLLs on board inside the FPGA to help you remove it. To learn more about the FPGA's clocking resources jitter characteristic, check your FPGA user guide and look at the specifications. Now, the Architecture Wizard has a jitter calculator that allows you to know how much jitter a PLL or a DCM will put on your clock. This value should then be placed on the clock when you make your period constraint. As you know, this clock uncertainty is automatically subtracted from the period constraint setup paths. The clock uncertainty is automatically added to the period constraint's hold paths. The offset constraints cover paths from input pads to synchronous elements, that is the offset in, and synchronous elements to output pads, and that is called the offset out constraint. Just as with the period constraint, the global offset constraints are associated with the clock net, which automatically groups the synchronous elements that will be considered as path endpoints. So in this example, we have one clock signal. It drives the same five flip-flops. The offset in constraint covers the nine input pads, Note that the input bus is 8 bits wide, and the offset out constraint will cover the three output paths. Now, a lot of people don't easily understand how there can be three output paths. Well, it's simple, really. The two source flip-flops have three different ways to get to two output pins. And as I mentioned earlier, the number of paths will vary greatly by the behavior of your design. Likewise, the input paths covered by the offset in constraint is usually mistaken because an input bus of 8 bits is used in this case. They just basically don't see the big fat wire, but you probably figured that out now. Also, you should note that even after specifying an offset in, an offset out, and a period constraint, it is still possible to have unconstrained delay paths, such as purely combinatorial paths that you see in this example. Remember that the offset in and out constraints do not cover paths between synchronous elements, and they do not cover paths that are purely combinatorial. This example shows how the tools use the clock distribution delay to calculate the effective offset in and offset out delay. As you know, the clock delay is a significant factor in the effective delay and cannot be ignored. Because the input data path and clock path are in parallel for input paths, the tools subtract the clock distribution delay from each input path. Likewise, because the output data path and the clock path are in series for output paths, the tools will add the clock distribution delay to each output path. Therefore, having a positive clock distribution delay helps your input times, but it hurts your output times. To compensate, Xilinx FPGAs include a delay lock loop and or a PLL for your chosen device that will remove the clock distribution delays from your input and output paths. These resources are very important for good chip-to-chip -chip timing. Remember that the PLL and DLL resources do not remove clock skew. The DLL only compensates for the clock distribution delay. The global routing resources are designed to minimize the clock skew, but they cannot remove it entirely. This slide shows an example from a timing report generated for an offset out constraint. As you know, this report can be generated when you use the Timing Analyzer utility. And again, as we mentioned, we cover the Timing Analyzer as part of the Designing for Performance course. 
You may recall that the offset out constraint covers output paths from synchronous elements to output pins. In this case, we used an offset out constraint of 16 nanoseconds. This constraint covers the effective output path, which as I just mentioned is a clock path delay plus the data path delay. In this case, please note this is highlighted in the red square, the clock path to this register is 4.6 nanoseconds and the data path was 3.8 nanoseconds, which makes an effective delay of 8.4 nanoseconds, which is highlighted in the red circle, which is what the tools found for the longest constrained path to be constrained by the offset out constraint. So this is verification to you that the implementation tools automatically account for the clock distribution delay for each data path. They provide the most accurate timing information possible, including taking into account the clock jitter. They use the jitter defined on the associated period constraint. Because the tools account for the clock distribution delay, you can specify your pin-to-pin -pin timing goals without knowing what the internal clock distribution delay will be. Well now, we wanted to give you a chance to test your knowledge of the basic global constraints and what paths they cover. This is a, again a very simple example, certainly not very realistic, but I wanted to make sure you had a chance to think of another example. In this case, I based the questions on some of the most common questions I get. So this example contains two clock nets, which is important because this means that if you were constraining this design, you would probably use a period, an offset in, and an offset out for each clock domain to properly constrain the design. The first clock, clock one, has two synchronous elements, which is probably the first question you would ask, how many synchronous elements are in each clock domain? Because that will dictate how many paths will be constrained. In this case, the period constraint will cover one path from the flip-flop to the latch. The second clock, clock two, has only one synchronous element. So a period constraint on this clock would not actually constrain any paths. This is again because the tools do not have a path from a source to a destination synchronous element. Now we want to introduce you to the Xenix Constraints Editor so you can get an idea about how you're going to be making your global timing constraints on your design. To start the Constraints Editor, double click the Create Timing Constraints button in the Processes window of the ISC software. If you don't see this button, expand the User Constraints button to then see the Create Timing Constraints button. After the Constraints Editor opens, there is a Constraints Type window in the upper left hand corner of the GUI. This is highlighted in red in this example. To make your global co timing constraints, double click the Clock Domains button. This will open the Create Timing Constraints GUI, which automatically reads from your design's netlist. All the clock signals and I.O. pins from your design will automatically be read. So as you can see from this screenshot, the input clock signal has a name of clock underscore pin. This then propagates a group name, or in this case, a clock time name of clock underscore pin. So it borrows that name. That makes sense. That makes it easier to make your constraints. The time spec name is automatically given as TS underscore clock pin, and that's just a label. And in fact, all they did was take that group name and just put in TS underscore in front of it. And the TS will stand for timing specification. This makes it easier later on when you're reading your UCF contents to actually identify the timing constraints because they have the TS in front of them. So this is the label the timing constraints will be given in your UCF file. So to make a period constraint, you just right click on the constraint that has already been made and click on edit constraint. To make a new period constraint, you right click in the Create Timing Constraints window and select Create Constraint. The constraint entered will have default units of nanoseconds and assume a 50-50 duty cycle. But this can be modified with the GUI. As constraints are made with the Constraints Editor, they are added to the User Constraints file. And then you can use any text editor to edit the UCF or again come back to the Constraints Editor and modify the constraints with this utility. Many designers keep their timing constraints in a separate UCF file from their pin assignments, area constraints and placement constraints. This allows the designer to keep all their fixed constraints, that is, their pin assignments and placement constraints, in one location, and then never modify the contents after they have implemented with those constraints. So you see, it's kind of human nature. They like to keep their timing constraints separate because they end up frequently editing their 
time and constraints file. And this makes debugging a little easier. So to help with this, the Xilinx Constraints Editor allows you to select a different constraints file to be edited and modified with the utility. And if you're not sure what constraints file you have, you can use the drop-down arrow to make sure that the tools find all of your design's constraints files.